Okay, um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry if I could uh, have your attention. I guess we'd like to get started. Good morning. I'm uh, Stephen Flanagan. I'm senior vice president here and uh, holder of the Henry Kissinger Chair in International Security Issues and uh, delighted to be your moderator this morning. Uh, we're going to move very quickly through the program and, and touch on uh, each of the key stops, but more sort of an issue focus. Um, we're going we're to start, uh, uh, first of all, with uh, our colleague Reginald Dale, who's uh, actually not at the end of the table, at the second from my left, uh, who's director of our, uh, as some, many of you know, I know uh, from his work in this on Transatlantic Media Network and also a senior fellow in the Europe program. He's going to touch on uh, US-EU uh, relations, uh, transatlantic, uh, various other aspects of transatlantic relations, and, and the all-important question of, of uh, what is Barack Obama going to do to make up for, to, to uh, Gordon Brown for those crummy CDs that don't even work that he gave him. So, uh, but uh, I think he's been, he's been putting on his thinking cap on how you can, uh, how you can overcome that. Uh, then uh, Stephen Schrage, uh, who's uh, our Scholl Chair in International Business, will uh, touch on the, uh, the G20 agenda in, uh, in some detail. Uh, then they'll come back to me. I'll, I'll touch on the NATO uh, summit agenda, the strasbourg kiel uh, summit, the uh, joint Franco-German hosting of this summit. And last but not least, uh, Bulent Ali Riza, the director of our, our uh, uh, Turkey project here, uh, will uh, touch on the president's uh, uh, two-day stop uh, in uh, both Ankara and Istanbul, which, uh, which is uh, promising to be uh, one of the more interesting parts of the trip. So. Um, we have uh, provided you with a number of background papers as well on uh, all of these issues, uh, including uh, just one word, commercial word of advertisement, uh, uh, the advance of, a, of a, a major study that Bulent and I and a number of other colleagues have been involved in here on looking at the U.S.-Turkish relationship and uh, where that is going and how Turkey's changing internal dynamics and its relations with all of its neighbors are going to affect U.S. interests. But let me turn uh, then to first to Reggie Dale and uh, uh, for a review of uh, some of the some of the broad transatlantic issues in USCU. This will be uh, rather broad, but I, I thought that as there's so little time, I'd, I'd do a sort of series of bullet points. Um, uh, and, and the first bullet point is very a general point, which, which um, is that President Obama has been talking for many months, uh, if not. Uh, a year or more about the need to restore U.S. leadership around the globe. Um, this trip is his first chance actually to start doing something about that, putting it into these promises into practice. Uh, for the first time, he'll be sitting around a summit table, several summit tables with world leaders. He'll be there as the first among equals, um, which is the first time he's been in this um, a particular environment, uh, rather than being on a pinnacle by himself, as he is in the United States. Uh, so the other governments will be looking, um, will regard this as a real test of, of uh, his leadership, particularly, I think, in the economic section, where the whole world is suffering, and th there's a real opportunity for uh, the president to show global leadership by... Uh, uh, which, in fact, he has not yet done in, in all his uh, talks to the United States, including the uh, to U.S. audiences, including last night's press conference. It, it has entirely been in domestic U.S. political terms. Now, that's obviously understandable um, in terms of U.S. politics, but he has not so far attempted to place the economic crisis in a global perspective, uh, say what he wants to do for poor people around the world, uh, take a broader look at how America depends on the global economy and on exports and therefore it should combat uh, protectionism. And I think it would be a real expectation for him to step up to the plate uh, in that respect. Secondly, second point, um, for th this president is the first for decades who has no, virtually no experience or knowledge of Europe. Um, and I think not much instinctive feel for it. Uh, I, one could provide a couple of examples of that, um, but I want to move on, on quickly. Uh, nevertheless, he remains uh, a superstar in European public opinion, <coughs> even uh, more than here, in fact. Uh, the latest poll I could find on this was one taken um, just after the inauguration, uh, which showed that whereas in the United States, 68% believe that Obama will have a, a positive impact on the course of international uh, events. 
uh, in Europe, uh, the numbers who believe in, that he'll have a positive impact are 92 percent in France, 90 percent in Italy, 85 percent uh, in Spain, 82 in Germany, and 77 in Britain. So actually, there's a even more expectation uh, that he will have a positive impact on the world in Europe. Um, one might even say that uh, Europeans uh, seem to be more in love with him than he is with Europe. Um, in his Berlin speech last July, he talked about uh, the walls. He said, the walls between old allies on either side of the Atlantic cannot stand. Now, that was a, a, a somewhat hyper, uh, hyperbolic because actually uh, there, weren't, there aren't many walls um, to dismantle. In uh, his second term, President Bush had made a big effort to um, repair relations with Europe and particularly with the European Union. Uh, he had actually moved towards the Europeans in a number of, of fields such as Iran, Middle East peace, and climate change. And the relations were pretty good, at least between governments. Now, Obama's policies are closer to European policies. Uh, in a number of respects on, on uh, climate change, for example, uh, his uh, um, commitment to a multilateral approach to world problems, uh, and on uh, the domestic uh, issues like universal health care, that is uh, something that Europeans, of course, uh, feel sympathetic to. Um, and as Gordon Brown, so there is a big opportunity for, for a closer relationship. And uh, Gordon Brown, when he was here just recently for his, um, gave this address to joint houses of Congress, said never before had a, a U.S. president faced uh, so many pro-American leaders in Europe. Uh, and he was referring, of course, to himself and President Sarkozy in France, um, Charles Merkel in Germany, and uh, Prime Minister Berlusconi in um, Italy. Now, that doesn't mean there are no differences. Uh, there are, both between uh, President Obama and Europe and among the Europeans themselves. Uh, there are differences um, between the U.S. and Europe on Afghanistan, on Russia, on economic policies, and are particularly uh, an area that the Europeans feel extraordinarily um, uh, important is uh, the whole area of trade, protectionism, the Doha round of talks, which is, in fact, the biggest multilateral effort uh, underway in the world today. And that, I think, would be the area where I would, if I was writing his talking points, I would say that he should show the most uh, leadership. <clears throat> uh, Steve referred to his relations with Gordon Brown. Um, well, there's a certain amount of public relations making up to do there, I think, because the, the, the British press, at least, uh, is convinced that uh, uh, President Obama dissed uh, Gordon Brown in uh, <clears throat> Washington, both uh, in terms of the inadequacy of his gift uh, and uh, in terms of uh, substance, and, and partic but particularly in terms of protocol. Um, so it would be nice if he could make some sort of gesture there. The, the splits inside... Um, the EU are over uh, areas like um, the uh, degree of economic stimulus the Europeans should apply. Uh, there's a lot of ill feeling in some countries, particularly in Eastern Europe, that their Western European colleagues are not showing enough solidarity in confronting the economic crisis. And there are splits over how to deal with Russia and that would be reflected um, in any attempt if uh, Obama wanted to round up the Europeans uh, for a joint policy or joint initiative towards Russia. Um, now, uh, so you could say, well, in most of these areas, actually, uh, the UK is closer, uh, as it often finds itself, closer to the US position than the, 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 the continent, to the continent, particularly on uh, the need for more economic stimulus and on the need for a bigger effort in Afghanistan. On both those issues, you'll find the UK sort of rather uncomfortably straddling the Atlantic. Um, uh, so uh, I think one could sum up by say, saying a couple of things. One is that um, 
by the end of his second term, uh, Bush was much closer to the European governments than he had been, but he was still strongly disapproved of by a lot of the general public. Uh, whereas Obama is adored by the general public, but still has to prove himself to the governments. Uh, and in approaching that, I think Obama will be driven not by the kind of sentimental, nostalgic, common values we share sort of approach that uh, is normal for U.S. presidents, but more it'll be his approach will be more by government uh, governed by what are the U.S. needs. Uh, for, for partnership in solving international problems. And, and uh, I hope that that doesn't lead him to underestimate the contribution that Europe can make on, on many of these issues. And I'll stop there for now. Great. Thank you very much, Reggie. Uh, Stephen Schrager, you have the, the biggest agenda. Oh. Yeah, and, and I think this is going to be a very challenging meeting. And I, I think there's three key points I'd like to make on this. First of all, the stakes are incredibly high. Um, in our briefing before the G20 meeting last November, I said the, the idea that you would somehow try to rework the entire financial system in a Bretton Woods 2.0 at that point in time was kind of like calling together the fire chiefs in the middle of a five-alarm fire to restructure the fire department. Now we're five months later. We're at a different stage, and there's been some encouraging signs, but we're still fighting a fire that is still uncontrolled and has spread from the U.S. financial and housing markets to virtually every corner of the globe. It's wiped out world trade and GDP growth in a way we haven't seen in a half century. And perhaps most importantly and overlooked, it's sowing seeds of potential instability with unemployment, uh, protest, you know, spreading across the world everywhere from Latvia to China in a way that I don't think has been f fully understood by the political process. And most government action, I would say, a lot of think tank analysis on this tends to be, I'd say, a step or two behind the spread of this, of this phenomenon, this fire, uh, trying to shore up at times firewalls that have already been breached. Uh, for example, there's been a lot of debate about the lessons of the Great Depression and the failed 1933 economic conference, but most of these have focused on the economic aspects when in reality the Great Depression really wasn't ended by any economic action. It was ended by conflict that spread from instability and ultimately authoritarian regimes. Now, no one's suggesting we're at the 1930s right now. Um, we're far from it. It's a different world. But when you've got the director of the national intelligence uh, for the United States saying that the economic crisis is now the na number one national security threat and seeing the raw data, it's something we really need to pay attention to. And as Reggie mentioned, it's also incredibly high stakes for the individual leaders. You know, President Obama is not only confronting the biggest challenge he faces, he's doing it for his first time on this type of world stage. He's doing it just weeks into his presidency when many key members of his team, particularly at Treasury, aren't on board yet. Others are under fire for the AIG or other aspects of the financial rescue packages. So it's a very challenging time from his perspective. Also from the key EU leaders, you've got Gordon Brown facing election before 2010, Angela Merkel facing elections, many other EU leaders that will have their own political pressures going forward. You may have potential widespread protests in London um, as this develops. China is being called on to do a lot more, but it may fall below the 8 percent growth rate that it targets to prevent internal instability. And you've got all world leaders very cognizant of the fact that any open disruptions or disagreements could shake markets and shake confidence in the way going forward. So you've got these high stakes. I guess the second question is, is the G20 really addressing the core challenges we face? I think in the run-up to the conference, you've already seen uh, governments dampening down expectations. And I think there's a real risk of a disconnect between the level of the challenges we have to confront and what we're going to be able to achieve through a one-day conference, especially with a new administration that's only been several weeks in office. In terms of the immediate economic areas, things economists look at like stimulus policies, monetary policies, reviving the banking system and lending, this has been hurt by, you know, widely publicized rifts between the EU leaders and the U.S., uh, even in terms of metrics for stimulus and whether additional stimulus is needed. Um, and in terms of also in terms of monetary policy and rates. Um, we've, we have a, a, a new fairly aggressive bank policy, but it was only unveiled this week, so there's going to be a question, is there enough time to coordinate or see how it's taking hold? 
Um, the EU and others have pushed international regulation to the forefront of the agenda. And I think there's a widespread agreement that we're going to have to look at both international and national strategies on regulations. But the key question, again, is in the middle of this crisis and this firefight, should we be focusing on long to mid-range things when we still don't have control of the basic dynamics going forward? Uh, and there's also a number of efforts, kind of what I would call shoring up the firewalls, or to use the Katrina analogy, shoring up the levees for this unprecedented storm that we're facing. I think we are going to see some positive action on the IMF in terms of increasing IMF funding. Uh, China looks like it may uh, give up to $100 billion in this, in this tranche. I think the IMF itself took some key actions in terms of lowering standards so that more people will have access to funds that was announced, I believe, today or yesterday. Um, on trade, I think this has been some of the most disappointing part of the G20 from November. It was really a toothless tiger. It gave this, you know, apparently strong statement about halting protectionism and reviving the Doha round that was routinely ignored or honored in the breach as 17 of the 20 G20 members enacted new protectionist measures. Um, it's, it was interesting to see whether there will be anything more than symbolic statements at this meeting, though I think there's some evidence of, the, of progress potentially on trade finance which collapsed in the crisis. But uh, one of the problems is, again, in the storm, the system, our world trade system was built to deal with one or two violations. If everybody's passing by America provisions or pushing the bounds of what's legally possible, and it takes two years for a WTO case to go through, you could have a meltdown before the system could address it. So what are we doing to shore up and expedite that kind of processing? Um, on wider strategic issues that I mentioned, there doesn't seem to be much on the agenda other than I know President Obama has mentioned food security, which may kind of creep in under that front, though the situation in Eastern Europe on the doorstep of the conference could push this to the forefront in the days ahead. So finally, um, you know, given these lower expectations, what's to watch for in the summit to see if it's a success? And maybe the most important piece of it may be that we're setting up a process going forward, which isn't even a given at this point in time. Um, one thing to watch is obviously are the underlying divides that we've seen being deepened or actually being bridged. Obviously, the U.S.-EU divide on regulation versus stimulus. China in terms of the IMF, you know, but also participation in how we allow emerging powers to have a greater role. But one thing that I think was key to watch in the uh, finance minister summit was for the first ever the BRIC countries issued their own statement. That's Brazil, Russia, India, China. And you've seen Russia and China call for a new global currency, concerns about U.S. debt and the management of our economy. Is this going to be a competing block? And then how are the other emerging powers that are at, the, at these conferences going to align, either with the traditional G20 or maybe a new brick block? That's very early stages and something we'll have to watch. Second thing is more than words. Um, you know, are there going to be any other concrete actions besides the ways I mentioned or operational ways forward? How they plan to do something in the G8 or G20 is as important as what they pledge to do. They really have no operational capacity. And I know from leading this effort on crime and terrorism in 2004, you know, they can make these pronouncements, but if there's no follow-up, not much gets done. They don't even have a, a secretariat. So they tend to task agencies like the, the IMF, the Financial Stability Forum, the WTO, but do these institutions even have the resources, capability, or political will to tackle these unprecedented challenges rapidly at this time. And there's even a debate on the future of the G20 leaders process. Is this going to go on? Is the G8 going to reemerge? So it's really open. So we really got to see, is there, is there a road map going forward? And then finally, um, is there any recognition of these broader security challenges that I mentioned? Um, that this has gone beyond just being a pure economic crisis to being a political, strategic, and potentially security crisis? Or are we missing some of the greatest lessons of the old, of the Great Depression in the 1930s? So that's a lot I know and, uh, and a lot to chew on, and I look forward to, to your questions and thoughts on that. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, so I'll touch on the NATO agenda, and I'd like to just, first of all, uh, outline a bit why the NATO summit, what's the significance of it, what, was, what is the overall goal of the rest of the allies, and then talk a little bit about uh, what does uh, President Obama and the, and the U.S. administration hope to get out of it, what would be uh, sort of cast as a success, uh, given that this is also, as some of my colleagues mentioned, his first, uh, his first meeting uh, with all of his uh, fellow uh, heads of state and government, as they say in NATO, who uh, will be attending the NATO summit, uh, 26 uh, going to possibly uh, 28 uh, members of the alliance. 
So the summit, uh, like uh, those of you who have covered NATO will know that uh, oftentimes NATO schedules a summit and wants to highlight one thing, uh, some part of its evolution or development, and indeed that was part of the, the goal even many years ago when it was decided, of course, it was this important milestone, 60 years of its existence, uh, would be a great time to take stock and, and focus on, on the alliance's uh, past successes and, and future direction. But of course, like many other NATO summits all through the 90s uh, that ended up focusing on the Balkans, this summit is going to focus on Afghanistan. There's no question about it. But, but, uh, uh, but uh, let me talk a little bit, though, about the, 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 uh, the other parts of the agenda. Um, that uh, because of this uh, fact that it is, uh, it is an, uh, a sort of an unusual summit and the notion that it's being held jointly in, in Strasbourg, France, and Kiel, and Baden-Baden, Germany is, is to be partly symbolic and to reflect the fact that, uh, that NATO uh, has uh, contributed uh, in enormous ways to the, uh, to the stabilization of Western Europe and the recovery in the, of, the, of those countries and the development of the European Union. And, and that sort of, uh, sort of touchstone, coupled with uh, France's uh, a decision uh, and, and, and a very controversial one, as many of you know, to, uh, within France, to, uh, to rejoin or, as they prefer, to engage in full participation in NATO's integrated military structures, uh, is another part of the symbolism that, uh, of it being a Franco-German event. The timing is uh, certainly uh, not optimal from the Obama administration's perspective because coming in very early uh, uh, before uh, all of its uh, uh, policy reviews are completed, first of all in Afghanistan, but also um, uh, on a number of other issues related to transatlantic relations, it ma it's made it a bit, uh, I'm sure, a bit challenging with, uh, with uh, not all of the, the full uh, interagency team in place. But nonetheless, obviously, consult consultations are going ahead, uh, and, and particularly on Afghanistan, there's been a great deal of back and forth. Um, on Afghanistan, the, uh, the summit agenda, just as actually the, there was a summit last year in Bucharest in, in, uh, in April, the, almost exactly a year uh, ago, uh, th this domination of the, of the question of, of what is NATO's future mission in Afghanistan, uh, and of course looking first to the, uh, the strategy, the new strategy and approach that the Obama administration will be putting forward but also to, uh, to look at how NATO might restructure its own activities um, and uh, what, uh, you know, at a critical juncture at a time when, uh, as you know, violence is uh, continuing to uh, increase uh, in the south and the east, and e even, even in during what is normally considered a relatively uh, less intense period of the counterinsurgency. Now with the, with the high part of it, with the snows melting and the mountain passes and, and obviously the, the problems of sanctuary in Pakistan coming, this, this whole question of how can the alliance deal more effectively uh, with this erosion of security and how also, and there's a lot of discussion over the last several years of how can the alliance better integrate uh, both some of its activities that deal with a st a stabilization and reconstruction and, and the uh, development of, of, of civic action, but also with other international organizations and with the Afghan government itself. And that is a big part of this agenda and so defining that concept and, and how this uh, will fit in with what will be presented, I think not as a fait accompli, but as a, as a, as a, as a proposal for further discussion and refinement of the administration, Obama administration strategy and, and how the allies can support it. Um, the, the other big issue out there that uh, was a bit, bit previewed already uh, in the ministerial, uh, there was a NATO ministerial uh, meeting earlier this month, of course, Secretary Clinton was there uh, to, uh, to discuss the whole question of Russia. Uh, what, uh, there was a ministerial decision to essentially agree to go ahead and resume uh, as soon after the, uh, the summit meeting, uh, NATO-Russia uh, dialogue within the NATO-Russia Council and also looking for specific elements of future cooperation. Uh, the big question is, well, what, what is it that the United States and, and its allies want to do with Russia in that context? Um, and that will be certainly an area of discussion. Uh, there is also a, a, the question of what to do about the very robust commitment that was made last year uh, to Georgia and Ukraine that they will, indeed will, underscored, become members of NATO someday. Enlargement is not on the agenda this time. Uh, there will be some effort, though, to, to, uh, to discuss uh, the commitment without walking away from it and how relations with Georgia and Ukraine can continue to be strengthened, both uh, by NATO and, and other member countries. Um, but, uh, but, there, and there is, uh, but there is also the question of, of how will that be balanced with this opening to Russia. Um, there is a, a sort of a, a, a sort of a one bit of tidying up uh, Croatia, uh, two of the Balkan countries, Croatia and Albania, had been invited earlier to join the alliance. And it looks likely that Croatia will join, uh, uh, making it number 27, and Albania possibly if all of the uh, necessary uh, protocols are, ratif uh, are ratified by the various member governments. So that's another bit of 
And lastly, a bit of the agenda, sorry. Lastly, the, um, the summit will launch a process, and this is a bit of NATO internal business and housekeeping, but it, but it has broader strategic significance, and that is the question of, of NATO's uh, new strategic concept. Uh, there's broad consensus that the alliance uh, strategic concept, which dates uh, from 1999, essentially the blueprint for what is the nature of the challenges NATO confronts and how should the alliance be organized to deal with them uh, militarily and uh, in its political dimensions. Uh, that hasn't really uh, been refined for a decade. And, well, that last concept, and, and I actually was involved in, in some of the drafting of it in, in, in government at the time, was very focused on, on the uh, insta question of instability along the, in the near periphery of alliance, you know, particularly the lessons being learned at that time in very hard ways uh, about dealing in NATO's role in peacekeeping in the Balkans. But it really uh, predates the whole uh, uh, awareness that came also starkly after, two th after uh, September 2001 about the global nature of security problems. The uh, last strategic concept didn't say much about terrorism. It talked a little bit about proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. Uh, it, uh, it, uh, it did talk about, uh, you know, some other questions of, of uh, the need to enhance uh, 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 integration of efforts in, in peacekeeping, but it didn't really uh, grapple with this notion of these kind of very long duration missions that NATO's finding itself involved in. And related to this, uh, and one other last bit of housekeeping, which could be uh, somewhat controversial, although it, looked at, it looks as if it's coming together, uh, the current Secretary General of NATO, uh, uh, Jaap de Hoop Scheffer, the Netherlands, his term is expiring uh, right after this summit. Uh, the leading candidate who has the support of the U.S. evidently in most of the major European governments is the Danish Prime Minister um, Rasmussen. However, uh, uh, he is somewhat of a controversial figure in Turkey uh, and, and uh, because of uh, the, uh, the whole uh, cartoon episode a few years ago and the, the idea that this could be controversial. There are a couple of other dark horse candidates, Peter McKay, the Canadian Defense Minister, uh, and, and this sort of a uh, another candidate uh, who's sort of there, I think, in the mix more to make a point, uh, Radek Sikorsky, the Polish foreign minister, who um, wants to make the point that 10 years after the Central East European countries joined the alliance, it, it's maybe time for the alliance to have a, a Central European uh, uh, secretary general. Now, just quickly on Obama's uh, uh, measure of success or what the administration hopes to get. First of all, uh, it's, it's very much the same uh, uh, sort of sense uh, as Reggie talked about. Obviously, this is President Obama's chance to be among his peer uh, in the, peers in the alliance to uh, establish his style of leadership. There's tremendous expectations and, indeed, a lot of discussion, I think, of people in the government about we have to, you know, sort of manage expectations, and uh, this is not – uh, uh, you know, this is going to be a step-by-step -step approach. But I think the, 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 uh, the goal is to, uh, I sense, is to some try, try to balance of uh, providing a strong sense of leadership, but also in the emphasis that you saw in, in some of Secretary Clinton's consultations and other consultations in the administration, that also we have a president now who's listening. Uh, that was one of the big laments, I think, about previous administration that uh, there was seemed to be more in broadcast mode all the time. And, and even going back further and looking at other administrations, this whole question, this delicate uh, balance within NATO uh, uh, and within really the transatlantic relations more broadly, how do you provide a sense of strong American leadership without making it look as if uh, we're just coming to, uh, to give them the plan and hoping that they'll all fall in line smartly behind us? So that, that will be, and, and I think, uh, you know, President Obama is, is uh, as gifted as anyone in, in trying to strike that kind of balance. Um, now, uh, on Afghanistan, I think their American expectations are being lowered, or Europeans are trying to lower American expectations. And indeed, uh, some of you might have heard uh, the British Defense Secretary Hun uh, uh, here last year, uh, last week, I'm sorry, uh, Hutton, uh, he was uh, noting how uh, he too didn't expect there to be much uh, in the way of uh, additional European combat troop commitments. There may be some modest additions, uh, but it's more likely that European governments will be offering uh, trainers uh, for both the uh, Afghan National Army and the Afghan uh, police, uh, but also, uh, and there, there is some effort underway within the EU, in fact, led by the, the Polish Foreign Minister uh, Sikorsky, to, to try to uh, develop a Friends of the EU for Afghanistan that would try to uh, provide some additional capability on the EU side uh, to uh, strengthening governance and, and civil society within Afghanistan. And so that will be very interesting to see if if, uh, if, um, if there is anything uh, forthcoming, but, and, and I think there will be. Uh, but the other thing is to, is to basically uh, secure uh, a, a strong endorsement of the, uh, of the U.S. strategy. That will be uh, certainly a mark of, uh, of success uh, for the Obama administration. On Russia, I think the Allies will be looking for what is the Obama administration's approach. Uh, I think given all the focus on the financial crisis and, Af and, uh, and, and the Afghanistan-Iraq 
uh, uh, rebalancing. Uh, I'm not sure how far along the policy is on Russia. Uh, clearly, the arms control agenda in the U.S. bilateral context, uh, start, follow, and other things will be given some prominence in the, in the sense that the administration wants to move out on that. But the whole question of what would, what would the U.S. like to see the alliance do with the Russians, what, what are areas do we see of, of useful mutual cooperation, I think is yet to be defined, uh, or I haven't seen, seen any signs that there's a clear commitment on that, but, uh, but there is some hope that, uh, that uh, perhaps uh, there can be movement back. One, one sort of interesting issue that's out there in the background, is, which is uh, very related to NATO's operations, is this notion of a northern uh, corridor of resupplying the ISAF mission in Afghanistan, which would run through Russia, and uh, that could be one of the uh, one of the big issues on how uh, is NATO willing to have Russia have, uh, in a sense, a uh, a bit of control and leverage over its uh, supply line to the international security force, uh, uh, you know, from Western European ports through Russia into Central Asia and then on to Afghanistan. So to have a secure northern route, given the perils of the southern route. Um, and uh, so lastly, um, the, uh, the, this question of, uh, you know, the President needs to show that he's established a, a clear process for, an effective process for developing this new NATO strategic concept and to put forward some ideas on internal reform and also that, uh, that, uh, that he's uh, struck a new uh, uh, approach and a, and a welcoming of the French into full participation in the alliance because I do think that uh, that, that will uh, both give France uh, more uh, influence in the alliance and, and, and NATO some additional and, and, and quite capable uh, military assets but also uh, hopefully uh, finally uh, square the circle or begin to square the circle on some of the difficult questions of NATO cooperation with the European Union and, and the whole concern that, that France was really pushing the EU security identity and, and capabilities as an alternative to NATO. Uh, and hopefully this will begin to put some of that to rest and NATO and the EU can find some way to cooperate. So let me turn it over now to Bulent for a discussion of Turkey. Yeah, I'll keep it brief because I know you got questions and uh, it's 20 to 10. Um, you may be wondering why it is that he's going to Turkey, uh, uh, but there is actually a thematic link between uh, his first three stops and the one in, in Turkey, and it's also of uh, great symbolic importance. <coughs> Turkey is a member of the G20, and Prime Minister Erdogan will be participating in the, uh, the meeting in London. Uh, Turkey is also a member of NATO. It actually possesses the second largest army after the U.S. in, uh, in, in NATO, uh, so it's uh, um, very much a, a component of the, uh, the effort to strengthen the transatlantic defense cooperation. Um, of course, uh, with respect to the, to the first stop, Turkey is an emerging market, and uh, having been very successful in its recovery program, um, uh, it obviously is going to be affected by, by the crisis, so that will uh, be uh, uh, something that the Turks and the, uh, and, the Americans will, uh, and the American president will talk about. And of course, the, uh, the third is that Turkey is uh, in the middle of an accession process, trying to get into the European Union. There are many problems uh, with respect to, the, to that process. The U.S. has been very supportive and has been using, has been trying to use this influence with the, with the Europeans. Um, and uh, so you can actually see the logic which led to the, to the choice of Turkey uh, when you take the overall trip into account. But there's also great symbolic importance attached to, to the trip. Turkey is not just a member of the Western community of nations, but it's also because 99% of its population is, is Muslim, it's a member of the, uh, the Islamic world that uh, President Obama has been trying to, uh, to, to reach out to. Uh, echoing Reggie, um, uh, Obama will start with a great advantage when he gets to, to Turkey uh, because his name is not George Bush. He was extremely unpopular in Turkey as well as in the, uh, the Islamic world. There's um, uh, a, a sense of goodwill uh, towards the U.S. and particularly towards uh, President Obama with his uh, uh, assumption of power. And the entire Islamic world will be watching uh, the speech he will be making at the Turkish Grand National Assembly in Ankara. Now, the administration has been at pains to, to stress that this is not the great speech that it promised to make in its first 100 days um, uh, directed at the Islamic world. But this may be a distinction without a difference because he's going to a country which is Muslim, and the entire Islamic world will be watching to see what kind of message he gives and whether he will indeed move away from the confrontational uh, relationship that characterized <coughs> the relationship between the U.S. and the Islamic world during the days of, uh, of President Bush. Uh, the Prime Minister, Turkish Prime Minister, has uh, uh, publicly called for redefinition of terrorism by the U.S. as it fights uh, um, uh, the, the global war against 
terrorism, a, a phrase which has not been used by, by this administration, uh, because he said that that was just too broad and was alienating the, the Islamic world. So uh, the words will have to be chosen very carefully when he gets to, to, to Turkey. Beyond these, uh, what are the issues that will come up in, in Ankara? One is, of course, Iraq. Turkey did not back the, the U.S. when uh, it went to war in 2003. It caused the great crisis in U.S.-Turkish relations. Uh, uh, U.S. troops were not allowed to go through Turkey um, uh, in order to attack Iraq. Um, now Turkey is willing to um, uh, uh, cooperate as the U.S. begins to withdraw. And Turkey is obviously going to be a key country in trying to maintain stability after U.S. withdrawal. Uh, the problem there is that Turkey has a difficult relationship with the Kurdish administration in the north, and particularly with the, with the uh, PKK bases from which terrorist attacks have been launched uh, on Turkey. Syria and Iran, uh, Turkey uh, 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 encouraged the Bush administration for uh, uh, the resumption of dialogue with uh, Syria and the initiation of dialogue with, uh, with Iran uh, to little avail during the Bush administration. The Obama administration may be more open uh, to Turkish suggestions on, on both of these issues. Um, Turkey also played a key role in uh, the indirect negotiations between Israel and Syria, something that the administration wishes to encourage. Um, uh, it's not clear when that will pick up uh, and whether the Netanyahu government will be as keen as the previous government in utilizing the Turkish role on this. The problem there is the uh, Turkish criticism of Israel uh, during the Gaza war and its advocacy overall for Hamas. It's something that the, uh, the U.S. has not been willing to, to, to pick up. Uh, beyond that, there's Afghanistan and, and Pakistan. Turkey has diplomatic leverage with both countries, fellow Muslims, of course. Um, but the, uh, the, U, um, uh, the Turkish government may not be uh, uh, open to the idea of sending combat troops, it's something that has been uh, uh, mooted in uh, uh, context between uh, Washington and Ankara. The Turkish general staff has said not a single combat troop will be sent uh, to Afghanistan, and the Turkish defense minister confirmed that just a couple of days ago. So uh, um, he may be uh, um, as uh, he may come up as empty-handed with, uh, with Turkey as uh, uh, he's likely to with the, with the other Europeans when it comes to this issue. And finally, uh, the, uh, the biggest issue uh, on the, uh, on, on the U.S.-Turkish uh, agenda, which you may not be familiar with, is the Armenian Genocide Resolution. This will come up, uh, this will be brought up by the, by the Turks. It has been, uh, the, the resolution has been introduced in Congress. Uh, the Turks are worried that having committed himself to supporting the resolution during the uh, uh, campaign as candidate, uh, President Obama may not uh, follow the example of Presidents Clinton and Bush in opposing the resolution, and may in fact use the, uh, uh, the word genocide himself. Uh, frankly, uh, none of the uh, uh, areas of cooperation that, uh, that, uh, that they will be talking about will materialize if, if this passes, because the Tur Turks will undoubtedly retaliate. Uh, and uh, we may go into a deep freeze in the US-Turkish relationship if, if it passes. Um, one last uh, uh, no, uh, word of caution. Um, of course, it's welcome uh, news to the Turks that, uh, that uh, the new, new American president is coming to Turkey so early in his administration. But the visit is occurring before the U.S. has actually put together, uh, uh, finished its review of U.S. foreign policy and has determined when, uh, sorry, how Turkey will fit into this equation. Uh, the U.S.-Turkish relationship is a very complicated one. There will undoubtedly be problems down the road. And the fact that the visit is occurring so early before the review of U.S. foreign policies has occurred may create problems. But nonetheless, it's, it's welcome um, uh, to the Turks, and it's a good development that is going to Turkey. With that, I'll stop. Great. Thank you. Okay. Well, we look forward to your questions and comments. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, one, one broader question about the G20. Uh, in the six decades since World War II, you know, American dominance and leadership of the international economic system has been pretty much unchallenged. The current crisis has given way to challenges to the dollar as the uh, international currency, to calls for letting emerging, emerging uh, uh, economies have more say. 
How real is this threat and how much is it a challenge to President Obama? Well, I would say right now, I think what you saw with the flow of capital into the United States is that we still, for, you know, for all the talk about multipolarity, I think it's, it's, really, mm -hmm. our, it's really a multi-tiered and multi-dimensional world, but the United States is at the center of so much of that. But it does raise a real question. That's not a given going forward particularly if we have kind of irresponsible fiscal policies or we let our debt get out of control or we fail to manage this process properly in the next couple of years, that is a real risk. And I think you see with the statements of, of China and Russia on, on, a, on a new currency model, um, you know, I don't think that's realistic in the short term. But over the longer term, they see the projected <laughs> deficits for the United States. They see that we may not be tackling some of our long-term problems. And if that trend continues, I think there is much more of a risk that, uh, that we would lose our ability, you know, with being the central reserve currency, with the world having confidence in our markets. So a lot of it's going to depend on U.S. leadership over the next couple of years. Well, how much is that a challenge to President Obama at this meeting? It, it, it's, well, it's a huge challenge right now because you can already you, you can see people kind of already rustling, you know, even before some of these plans go forward, even before – the United States has seen any kind of run on its currency or, or really challenge to its, to its treasury bonds. They're already, you know, uh, you know kind of, uh, you know, rattling the sabers, um, at, you know, about, you know, what, what's the problems if the dollar gets massively devalued or the U.S. economy fails to take hold. So I think it's a, it's a clear warning sign that uh, they've got to address this up front, and if they don't, you know, there's going to be, you know, severe ramifications from global markets. I'd like to just add, I'd like to add one word to that. Um, for the whole period since World War II that you mentioned, the United States has been the champion of the open free market global system. Um, and uh, that is now what is under threat from various directions. So <clears throat> it's really up to President Obama to step in and confirm that the United States is still the guardian of the global system, which the United States was instrumental in creating after World War II, and which it has always been the leading champion of, uh, and also to set an example, because if, if it's the United States begins to relapse into protectionism with, with Mexican trucks and buy American clauses and all that, then everyone else in the world will say, well, you know, the U.S. is doing it. They're, they're the big free marketers. Why, why can't we? So I, I agree with uh, it's a very important. I just wanted to add, because I think Reggie's exactly right on that point. And, and one of the key things you see is all of the trade talk that's going on right now is all defensive. You know, it's all kind of like how do we prevent backsliding? And if you talk to people, if there's no offensive agenda, it gets very risky because people, again, push the bounds of these Buy America acts or what they can do domestically in terms of protectionism through subsidies. I mean, subsidies to autos or others could basically be a Smoot-Hawley 2.0. I mean, there's a lot of ways you get to this race to the bottom of protectionism that don't involve tariffs. And if everybody's pushing that system and you've got a WTO system that doesn't have the political will to step into the breach or the capability to quickly review these, you've got an incredibly dangerous situation. And at the same time, you've got an administration that has yet to really take a strong position on the WTO Doha round. Um, South Korea may be chairing the next G20, you know, where you're showing this up, and we may be walking away or at least kind of slowing down the U.S.-Korea FTA at a time when the EU looks like it's going to complete one and may sign it at the G20 meeting. So it's really raising questions about what kind of leadership the U.S. is going to show towards open markets, and I think that vacuum can quickly become very dangerous. Yes, the gentleman in the back. Couple of questions. One, one for Reginald Dell and one for Stephen Schreich. Um, Reginald, you, you, you tantalizingly said earlier on that uh, you could provide a couple of examples of um, how Barack Obama has no instinctive feel for Europe. I um, wonder whether you could fulfill my um, uh, curiosity, um, satisfy my curiosity on, on that. And, 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 and Stephen, I, I was interested in what you said at the end of your piece about whether the, cri the economic crisis could yet become a wider security crisis and, and the lessons from the 1930s in that respect. I wonder whether you could just expand on that thought a little bit. 
I, I'll give you just a couple of examples. One was uh, when um, um, Obama went to Europe uh, last July uh, and first of all started by asking to give a speech at the Brandenburg Gate, where, whereas virtually anyone who knew anything about Germany would have been able to tell him that that would uh, n not, uh, I mean, that not only would that be refused, but it was sort of uh, hubristic or presumptu presumptuous to ask for that. Um, and in his speech in Germany, uh, he, he addressed the people of the world. It, it was all about, he said, people of Germany, people of the world. It, it, he used it as a platform to talk in, uh, for talking to the whole world rather than focusing on European yeah. issues. And when he did, he talked about these walls in the Atlantic which don't actually exist. Um, and secondly, uh, I think he, he didn't have the right feel in his meeting with uh, Gordon Brown just uh, recently. Um, if, if you, the, the British press vastly exaggerated, I think, some of these issues, but it was great, it was great fun anyway, um, the stories were. But, but the whole, his sort of body language when he was giving the, the briefing, uh, answering a few questions with Gordon Brown, I mean, the, the whole, his whole attitude seems to suggest he didn't think this was such a big deal uh, as, as the British did. And, and you know, the British, Britain is the uh, United States probably still its closest ally. It's got the biggest contingent of combat forces uh, in Iran, uh, no, Afghanistan after the United States by a long way. It's a member of the UN Security Council, cooperates incredibly closely uh, with the United States. And, and, and he, the, he just didn't give the impression that, that, that he sort of appreciated that. And, and then uh, he now um, has to, to sort of do something, I'm not quite sure what, to uh, try and uh, re <laughs> repair that, that, that public relations uh, lapse. Uh, and, and it's going to be difficult because if, if, if he comes to Britain with another gift for Gordon Brown, that, then it implies the first one wasn't adequate. So, um, <laughs> yeah, British CV. No, no. On the on the lessons of the Great Depression, I found it really interesting because there's been a couple talks, and and most of them all debate. You know, was it fiscal policy? Was it monetary policy? But they they kind of avoid this whole issue that we really don't know because you know ultimately everyone turned inward and and it led to this instability. And again, I, like I said, no one's suggesting we're in the 1930s right now, but uh, you've got a situation where we are turning inward. I mean, you look at the first State of the Union style speech or, or the, the, the presentations, most of it is not focused on foreign policy. Um, you know, it's been focused on internal domestic economic challenges, which is what I think happened at that point in time. And I think we run a real risk. I mean, you look at like the, the coverage of the newspaper headlines, you know, in, the, in 18 months before this crisis, you would barely see anything about housing bubbles or financial challenges. You know, they were all buried on the back pages. It was all Iraq, Afghanistan, Iran. Um, Russia, you know, now it's flipped 180 degrees, and you know, you're, you're, you know, none of those challenges went away, and indeed, the financial crisis may make many of those worse. I mean, you've got a huge population bulge across the greater Middle East that was concerning people when oil was at $150 a barrel. Now that it's more around $50 a barrel, you know, it's still going to be a great challenge. You've got potential unemployment and instability, you know, in everywhere from Eastern Europe to you know, protests in China from unemployed workers. I think these are, you know, and these are, are, are not things that, you know, may be bubbling to the surface right now, but when you've got people like the Nas Director of National Intelligence that are seeing the raw data in the field, and they're saying already, kind of raising warnings that this is our number one national security challenge, uh, the, the risk is that we're behind the curve again as we were approaching the economic crisis and realizing that we may have to be prepared to take rapid action to shore up. Uh, countries or institutions as they face these challenges, everywhere from you know Mexico with the you know you've seen a lot of press lately about the you know the, the drug lords and kind of the instability there. So so I think we can't we've got to focus on both and realize the security interconnections in a way that I, that I think is really rare and hasn't really been done. Yeah, and I think Steve can add some things on this too. I think you are seeing that in terms of a lot. I mean, even 
people that are open market, you know, free market advocates. You had Gordon Brown talking about British jobs for British workers. You had, you know, President Sarkozy talking about pulling back in, you know, auto manufacturing plants into, into France or, or jobs. So, I mean, you've seen some of that domestically, and some of that is focused by other groups that may take an even more milita militant stance towards nationalistic moves. So I think it's a natural response to some of these economic challenges, but it's one we've got to be very cognizant of. Steve, did you want to No, I was just saying, in some ways, the, some of the Central East European countries have been bellwethers on this. You've seen, obviously, two governments fall already, Latvia and, and Hungary. Um, you know, the rising expectations in all those countries has been diminished and, and led to a lot of social turmoil. So you see, you know, in Hungary and, and some other places, uh, rising uh, sort of anti-Roma gypsy sentiment, uh, anti-foreigner, some xenophobic growth of some of the sort of xenophobic kind of uh, extreme right parties. I think not hasn't really, you know, ballooned yet, but it but it is a worrisome trend. And I think uh, I think a number of people, and including as, as Stephen said, the the DNI and and others are looking at this and what does this mean longer term. But you even see some turmoil in some other very stable West European countries. Obviously, uh, the um, the Garda in Ireland demonstrating about layoffs there. I mean, the, the, the national police there. I mean, you know, some concerns about you know the social fabric there. Uh, you know, not 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 saying Ireland is going to be unstable. I'm just saying that there is there is a lot of social turmoil out there about you know where where some of the cutoffs going to come, uh, layoffs going to come in in uh, in the uh, you know particularly in, in countries where you have a large uh, public uh, payroll. So, but let me uh, turn on and remember over the questions. The lady in the back on the, the wall. I'm sorry. I am. Um I'm Sabine Muscat from the Financial Times Deutschland. I have a question for Dr. Flanagan on, um, about uh, the future role of NATO. Um, I would just like to hear a little more from you on um, where you see um, the debate going with regard to what NATO should be in terms of between the different poles from being more def a defensive alliance or an interventionist alliance, especially in times where it's hard to get troops for anything, and also if you think that the new administration has had enough time to think about these issues um, or if they were totally preoccupied with their Afghanistan strategy. Thank you. No, that's a, that's a very good question, and, I, and I, I should have touched on it a little bit more, but I was trying to be concise. But uh, yeah, this is there really is a debate. Uh, one of the questions that will be uh, really sort of brought uh, out in the d discussion of this new NATO strategic concept is how much should the alliance focus on what it calls the, sort of these uh, long-distance expeditionary missions uh, in dealing with instability uh, that could th and and other uh, other problems uh, out in the in the far reaches uh, away from NATO territory that could affect NATO security so Afghanistan being particularly that uh, one of those missions but even even in the you know in the sort of the near nearer periphery uh, in the Balkans NATO is still involved in mission uh, you know obviously a major mission in Kosovo it's supporting the EU mission in, in Bosnia Herzegovina in, in some ways so there's still a lot of NATO engagement in the what we in uh, and this was a, it was a study that uh, is available on our website that we did with a number of uh, three other think tanks here in town on, on NATO's future direction. And we talked about this idea of a need to rebalance uh, that uh, between NATO's involvement in what we call the away game or the, the game, uh, you know, out there on the sort of preventing threats from reaching alliance territory versus uh, some desire on the part of a lot of the publics and particularly in European countries that have seen uh, or, you know, recent terrorism uh, uh, episodes, you know, in Madrid and Istanbul and London, that, that NATO ought to be seen as a bit more active in, in doing, uh, and, and, and Central East European countries also worried about this vis-a-vis -vis Russia, NATO needs to rebalance and be sure that it has effective capabilities to uh, address the potential for uh, direct threats on alliance territory, be it from terrorism, uh, weapons of mass destruction, uh, uh, and, uh, and of course, uh, you know, for the, some of the Central East European countries, particularly the Baltics, the sense that, well, does NATO have credible plans to come to our assistance if indeed, for whatever reason, we had some kind of a little bit of a dust-up with the Russians, or the Russians argued that they were coming to, uh, uh, you know, defend Russian-speaking citizens in, in Latvia or Estonia, uh, how would NATO respond? And so th those are those are all uh, difficult questions that will need to be addressed. But Steve. I think what you're going to see is some rebalancing of uh, of uh, in, in the discussion of the strategic concept. This will be not so much coming to fore at the summit, but longer term, this idea that NATO needs to rebalance somewhat 
uh, where it's putting its investment and, and showing how it's it's also and indeed some of the some of the stuff that needs to be done uh, for the home game is not a, not necessarily that expensive but it's more a level of attention to do some what NATO would call some some deliberate or they're now calling prudent planning for various contingencies that might come up with regard to say the Baltics uh, to, uh, to to continue to work on this question of what does the alliance want to do whatever the US decides to do on the future of these two missile defense sites that are a bilateral issue between the Czech Republic and Poland what does NATO want to do about missile defense and the long-term potential for a threat from from Iran and other countries. So, we'll One thing we haven't touched on is uh, NATO-EU defense cooperation. Uh, and that's just gone by the way uh, and, uh, by, uh, and needs to be touched on. Turkey is a member of NATO, but it's not a member of the EU. So there have been problems uh, associated with Turkey as NATO-EU defense cooperation, which is very important for the future, has been tackled. So that's one of the issues that will undoubtedly come up on the trip. Thanks. Um, Go ahead. Okay. Uh, President Obama emphasized during the campaign that his popularity in Europe would help um, further the U.S. goals. I, I think one of the things that he even talked about during the campaign was was the idea of getting more European cooperation. Um, in Afghanistan, and I'm just wondering, it sounds like from what you're saying that he's not going to get necessarily a greater, a greater um, commitment of resources there. Is he making a, a miscalculation on this, and, and how is that going to play out at the summit? And also, I had a question for Bulent about Turkey. I'm just wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on how you think um, Turkey could play a role in brokering talks between the United States and Iran. Just to say quickly on the on the uh, Afghanistan and the NATO or the security side of this, I, I think that what I was trying to suggest that I don't think Ob that President Obama will, will probably not have much luck in, in it, obtaining additional combat forces. There just isn't the willingness on the part of most of the uh, European allies to do that right now, and including I think as Bulan said, there was some hope being pinned on Turkey. Uh, but uh, but because of the counterinsurgency in the southeast and other demands, uh, Turkey's not yet there. I do think there will be a willingness, and many of the allies, I think, are already uh, preparing their packages to provide additional support to the training missions, uh, which are not unimportant because they would relieve um, U.S. you know some of the U.S. Uh, forces from from that mission, uh, and and also additional civil resources. In some way, I think the administration would argue that if they could get more, and particularly, and this goes to the, what Bulent just alluded to about the NATO EU problem, if they could get more. EU EU engagement over time in, in strengthening governance. I mean, what you hear from General McKeon and others and uh, General Petraeus and their accounting of what's wrong in Afghanistan, it's the whole civil side of that mission. It's both weakness in Afghan governance and the, and the development of, of the civil side of the international assistance efforts that isn't well integrated. The money's going down a rat hole. People don't know where it's all going to and what it adds up to and how is it meshing together in a coherent way. So that's, that's one of the things that I think uh, that President Obama would, I think, and many of his advisors are hoping, and certainly Holbrook, as he looks at this idea of a number of European counterparts working with him. I mean, some talk about will we have sort of a contact group like we had on the Balkans to better integrate the overall effort. So a lot of this could still, I, I think, evolve over time. But the notion of additional hard power assets uh, in Afghanistan, I think, is, is probably going to be kind of slim. But Reggie. Yeah. So, a <clears throat> couple of points on, on that. Th this is what I was talking about, is where all these great statements uh, come in actually in contact with reality, with, with the political realities in Europe, with how Europe sees its own interests. And uh, however much uh, uh, it might be desirable in the American view for Europeans to send more troops to Afghanistan or to change the caveats that govern their performance, a country like Germany, for example, cannot do that with the best will in the world because the parliament, the Bundestag, won't let it. I mean, there are these basic political factors. The, the deployment of troops in Afghanistan is, is increasingly unpopular in most European countries. And European governments are not going to, for the sake of pleasing Obama, are not going to sacrifice these, uh, make concessions on these fundamental interests and political uh, requirements. Um, and uh, so that's where he comes confronted with what Europeans regard as their own best interests, which are not the same uh, as American ones in many cases. That also applies to the stimulus, uh, economic stimulus, where he's asked for a coordinated world economic stimulus. 
And uh, again, Germany is not going to, uh, has said it's done enough, it's not going to do any more. Germany is still absolutely haunted by the inflation of the 1920s that led to Hitler. And, and th these are fundamental things that you can't change just by talking uh, nicely. And I think that, from my understanding, is the Obama administration uh, has sort of shifted on that somewhat to accepting that. Uh, there's not much point in making demands on Europeans that they're unable to accept or, or will have to reject. That's counterproductive and it's not good uh, leadership. And therefore, he, he you know, in all, one must remember that all this, the, 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 the communiques are going to be issued at the G20, for example, has been being prepared for a long time. It's not the leaders going to sit down and, and say, well, what should we say now? You know, it's, it's all basically done. Uh, and and the, they're going to settle on, on vague uh, statements about, about, well, we'll do as much stimulus as we can and it's a good idea to have more regulation, that sort of thing. Uh, and it, so it's not going to be a question of using his political capital at the meeting to, to get the Europeans to change their uh, entrenched positions. Yeah, on, on Iran, um, Turkey was very worried uh, during the, uh, the Bush administration that they could, there would indeed be conflict between uh, uh, the U.S. and Iran, and the kind of tensions that arose after the U.S. attacked Iraq would leave it in a very difficult position. So it's, it's been very supportive of the idea of, of a dialogue. Uh, it also wants to play the role of a mediator. Uh, when, after Secretary Clinton visited Ankara, the Turkish president went to Iran and conveyed the messages uh, from the Clinton visit to, to the Iranians. Afterwards, the Iranians said that they preferred a direct dialogue uh, with uh, the United States, but that's not really on the cards. The Iranians will participate in the meeting in The Hague on, on Afghanistan. Uh, whether that then develops into a, a direct dialogue with, uh, between the U.S. and Iran uh, is not clear. And Turkey certainly wishes to use its good offices to, to facilitate this. But it really depends on whether the Iranians want to, want to curb their nuclear program uh, because the, the Turks are opposed to the development of a nuclear weapon on the part of, of the Iranians yet at the same time that they think that there was uh, too much pressure put on the Iranians, and the best way to deal with it is uh, through a dialogue. But if there is a dialogue, indirect or, 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 or direct, and that fails, then Turkey will find it in a very difficult position because now it's on the Security Council. It will have to uh, sign on to uh, 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 additional sanctions, and that's something that the, the Turks really want to avoid if they can. Uh, so two, two quick questions. Thanks for doing this. Um, you, several of you talked about this being President Obama's first opportunity to go and sort of show his chops abroad. I wonder what you think, if you could sort of describe what you think he has to prove, both substantively but also stylistically, and how we measure whether or not he's achieved that at the end of the eight days. Uh, and then second, quickly, on the um, – uh, on sort of EU US uh, European US relations if you had to identify one thing that represents the biggest uh, stumbling block or challenge would it be this, this sort of disagreement over stimulus or is there something else that represents uh, you know most likely the largest point of disagreement that uh, that we're likely to see particularly at the G20 Well, I, I think that overall the, the biggest question will be, okay, you, you've, you, you've talked a good game, you've said a lot of the right things, um, but not all the right things because, because he hasn't. There have been these big gaps on international economics. Now let's see if you can roll your sleeves up and say uh, in a sort of take charge way, yes, we are going to defend the global system, uh, free trade system. Yes, we are going to. We are totally committed to um, uh, abstaining uh, or, or from protectionism or, or actually confronting pr protectionism. I mean, that, that's very important um, to Europeans. Um, and I, I think the, uh, the, there are, are quite a few issues between the U.S. Uh, and Europe which won't really emerge as great clashes in this, um, on this trip because that's not what anyone wants. I mean, it's still the case that European leaders want to be seen next to Obama, preferably with Obama, his arms around their shoulders and a big smile, uh, because he's so popular in Europe. And, and, and nobody's going to try and, and, and raise awkward subjects 
uh, with him. Um, we haven't really got into the whole missile defense uh, question, which, which is very interesting because, as you probably know, the Czech government fell yesterday, and um, Obama's due to meet the Czech prime minister in, in Prague. The whole point was to go there for the because the Czech Republic is the president of the EU. Um, so that creates rather a complicated diplomatic and political problem, but that, that's really for the Czechs to resolve. That the, Their country remains the presidency, so they have to put up somebody to come and meet. And I think it will be the, the current uh, president. But, but if, if Obama so withdraws on, on missile defense, which he seems to be doing, then he is going to leave the Czech and Polish governments out there hanging in the wind because they went to, to great lengths to um, uh, reach agreement on those, uh, basing those facilities there, even though their public opinions were largely against it. Um, and uh, for Poland, it was regarded as a, a new U.S. security guarantee in, in the event of trouble from, from the East. So in Eastern Europe, that, that, that's a pretty big issue. And I think, you know, Reggie hit on some key points. I think that the, the overall test is going to be, does he map a way forward? I mean, they're going to paper over any differences in this, in this G20 statement, you know, likely. You know, if there, if there are big disagreements, you know, they'll, they'll have kind of innocuous language that, you know, as appropriate or, or whatever that, that kind of muddles, you know, the, the differences. But is there a concrete action plan and steps that he's going to lead to get out of this crisis and to rework the international system? If it's just a statement and it's just words and there's no follow-up plan, because there's key questions whether even the G20 is going to go forward at a leaders meeting. If there's not that, then I think there's going to be real questions. Is this, is this crisis just going to kind of continue to drift? without any clear leadership. Um, the two key issues below that that I think are, 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 at least on the economic side, are showing kind of potential rifts between the U.S. and Europe. Um, I think the stimulus and the regulation is one, but I think more deeply it's a question of regulation, whether it's at the international level, it's driven from a more top-down international approach, or whether it's drawn at, drawn at a national approach that's then coordinated internationally. I think the EU and a lot of others, and you've seen this talk about currency, kind of want to rein in U.S. power or capabilities into more of an international system that will kind of limit its range of action. Um, whether the U.S. goes along with that is going to be a tension. I think it's why you see them pushing regulation so far to the front of the agenda at this time. The second one is kind of the protectionist trade front. Um, you know, the U.S., has, as Reggie said, has always been the leader pushing this forward. Now that we've kind of stepped back a bit, the Europeans are kind of, or, or I think and others are a bit nervous. Who's going to kind of take up that banner and charge forward? Are they going to have to do it? Is the administration going to find a new way forward? And that's creating a lot of uncertainty internationally. This is to Bülent and Mr. Flanagan. Uh, how likely is a Turkish veto on Rasmussen? How likely is a Turkish veto on Rasmussen for NATO? Sense, yeah, I sense pretty unlikely. Uh, I think that they wanted to make the point. I don't know that Prime Minister Rasmussen himself had really been he had, he had been seen as somewhat defending the freedom of, of expression in, in, the, in the Danish internal debate but I, um, I think the Turks want to make a point but uh, I think they won't buck it, consensus seems to be very heavy I mean they, it would probably be 25 to 1 uh, at this point I think uh, on that question from what I've heard so I doubt it as far as I know there has been no uh, uh, disagreement uh, uh, in the selection of the National Secretary General uh, before ultimately they come together and everybody uh, approves it. But as of yesterday, a member of the Turkish Grand National Assembly who specializes in foreign affairs made a statement that Turkey was still opposed uh, to, to, to Rasmussen, that he was unacceptable uh, to Turkey. So I think uh, uh, some more diplomatic work needs to, to, to be done in, uh, on this issue. There's real bad blood between Rasmussen and, and the Turkish Prime Minister. Uh, the Turkish Prime Minister is a man who does carry grudges and he does not really like Rasmussen. 
And NATO remains the one link, uh, one firm contractual link between Turkey and, 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 the, and the Western community of nations because it's still in the accession process for, for the EU, and it doesn't really want to, de uh, to deal with the Secretary General in whom it, it doesn't have any confidence. So I'm not as comfortable with Steve that this issue has, uh, has been resolved or is about to be resolved. It could go right down to the line. If there's anybody else who wants to ask about Turkey, I'll take it. Otherwise, I'll have to, have to go. Thank, thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, I'm Daniel Anish with Czech Daily Paper, Hospodářské noviny. I am getting slightly worried what will happen in Prague, uh, uh, hearing that uh, President Obama doesn't have the instincts because he will meet as well Czech President Václav Klaus, who sometimes uh, doesn't have instincts neither. So we will see. Uh, however, uh, to the missile defense, uh, uh, the Czech government failed the non-confidence vote, which means that uh, the treaty was not ratified in Parliament and probably won't be for a long time. So in fact, doesn't this have uh, give advantage to Obama that now he can say the ball is on the Czech side Un until they ratify the treaty, I can't decide anything on missile defense. So couldn't uh, he just turn around the whole thing? Well, yes, he, he, he could say that. Um, I think that Poland is probably a, a bigger problem. Um, but I think uh, that uh, Obama is backing away from, from it anyway, and, and there's not very much support in, in Congress. Congress has been chipping away at finance uh, for missile defense, so they, they've been doing um, the job of the opponents of, of, of the, the, the deployment in Europe already. Um, but I, I think that's a fair point. That, that, uh, and of course, it looks like uh, the Czech Republic won't uh, ratify the Lisbon Treaty either for the, for the time being. So it's, it's, it's quite significant, this, uh, what's been happening in Prague. Yeah, I think, there, I think it's not clear that the administration's review on, on what approach it will take on missile defense is, is completed. Indeed, there was a very interesting development with the announcement that Representative Tauscher would be named the uh, Undersecretary uh, for Security Policy in the State Department. She has been leading the effort. Uh, and in fact spoke out about this in, at the Munich conference, uh, leading the effort to question the way in which the, in, within the U.S. Congress, the way in which the United States has been pursuing missile defense, even with regard to the sites in uh, Alaska, uh, but also the third, so-called third site in Europe of this spiral development and deployment, and is the, is the system really fully proven? So there's that debate that's already out there within the Congress, as, as, as Reggie said, but also within now, within the, it's, it's certainly out there within the administration, and even more prominently, I think, with Representative Tauscher, uh, getting that portfolio, assuming she's confirmed, and uh, which I would expect. But so, uh, but I think in any event, the administration's inclination, and, and indeed there's some question about uh, in the in the as we go forward with the quadrennial defense review too, uh, where do we want to put the investment, uh, and and is it yet, uh, you know, is it really that urgent? I mean, uh, the Secretary Gates even last year had hinted that there could be some delay in the uh, and at least the making operational the sites uh, in Poland and the Czech Republic because. The, the timing of the Iranian threat uh, might not be. I mean, the 2013 was the original uh, target date, but I think the Bush administration, as a legacy question, wanted to get the construction underway and make sure that these systems were eventually de developed and deployed rather than stretching them out. I think the Obama administration's inclination, may, at least at this point, will be to keep the option open, uh, but n not, not press ahead to say there's still some more research and, the, and obviously the Czech decision. Uh, helps. The other thing is the polls, frankly, the, the polls feel they got the big thing that they wanted, which was the commitment of the United States at the end of the last administration to increase, uh, enhance their air defenses. That, uh, which, is, which is directed against the potential of a, any kind of Russian intimidation or targeting, uh, is much more important uh, for the polls. And I think probably, uh, you know, the, the Czechs didn't quite push that, that button, but, uh, but for Central Eastern Europe, that concern rather than the Iranian one, which they see as a much longer term and maybe less direct threat, uh, is, is, is why I think that the support uh, out there isn't, isn't all that strong. So the, I think the administration will, will uh, be able to finesse this, but uh, at least for now, uh, will it reviews the longer term. But, but it also has to be careful not to look as if it's somehow capitulating to Russian pressure, and particularly the, the fact that Medvedev made these threatening noises about, well, we'll deploy additional missiles opposite Poland, uh, and that's why, and this is why the U.S. is delaying this. So it has to, it has to, I think there'll be an effort to keep the option open, 
argue that there's, you know, the threat isn't as emergent. It's, the threat is still there, but it's not as pressing maybe as, as uh, the, the construction has to start in, uh, in the next year or so. Uh, and uh, that uh, let's continue to, to look at other options. If my one, yes. sen one sentence on that. If, if uh, Obama wants to use it as a bargaining chip with the Russians, then he has some interest in maintaining the value of that chip. Uh, I mean, if, if, if he's going to let it go anyway, uh, then it, he hasn't got anything to trade. I have just one comment to it. Uh, I was at the missile, def missile defense conference now one day ago at the Reagan Center, and there was the General Cartwright, who is Deputy Chief of Staff, and he said uh, ballistic missile defense is passe as an email. Nobody is doing that. So we have to concentrate on other issues like uh, sensors and uh, information from satellites. So and the, uh, the guys, the professionals from the industry were just sitting there and watching him and listening what was going on, so. Definitely some questioning within the, within the military establishment as well on priorities and particularly as you start to look at other things that might go away like uh, future combat aircraft and, uh, and various ship and, uh, uh, shipbuilding programs and other things as opposed to spending on something that uh, at least some people in the technical community feel is not completely proven. So, yes, sir. What do you mean, in, in Europe or in the United States? In Europe. Oh. Well, he, he will continue to, to be regarded, I think, by the European uh, general public as a, as a superstar. Uh, I don't think there's, there's much he could, he could do. Uh, I mean, because we're surely going to get some wonderful uh, photo opportunities and you know, nice glossy uh, shots and, uh, and everything. I, I think there is a huge uh, hope among the European people that, that it would be hard for him to, to prick that balloon uh, just at, at an economic summer, uh, summit and a NATO summit, well, the details of which most Europeans are, are beyond most Europeans. You know, they don't follow these things very closely. They just see a bit of it on TV. Um, so I, I don't think very much. I, but the, 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 I mean, there are some concerns in Europe that which surfaced in the campaign that that, that, that he he wasn't. I mean, this is a sort of ironic uh, when he's being accused of being a socialist here. Um, there were a lot of people in Europe who thought, suddenly discovered he wasn't far, as far left as they thought he was. But uh, that was on issues like, like the death penalty and gun control, and they were rather horrified. And they thought, oh my gosh, we've supported this guy, and here he is in favor of the death penalty, which is one of the, you know, check this list items on, on, on which many European, oh, on which anti-Americanism is based in, uh, in uh, left-wing circles in Europe. So, but I, I think overall, uh, he, he, he'd, he'd have to work really hard to mess it up. Yeah, uh, continuing somewhat in this uh, question of style and popularity, but um, uh, if, I, if I think back, for example, to uh, Kennedy's uh, remembered visit to, to Europe, it's not really Kennedy or the issues of the time that I think of, but it's Jackie Kennedy. And um, so I'm wondering what um, kind of what role uh, you see for Michelle Obama and what she uh, what you expect her to see doing and if that if that will be an important part of sort of extending this aura. I, I think it will be because she is seen as, as glamorous in Europe. Um, ob obviously, uh, her agenda is totally different from uh, the G20 summit and the NATO meeting. In fact, she's been, as, as you know, hitherto in the White House, been kept aside from policy and, and treated uh, um, more as, as somebody representing glamour and motherhood and, and uh, uh, those non-policy related um, uh, areas. Uh, but, but she's definitely p part, of, uh, p part of the image, yes, and, and, and um, a positive one. I, I should add on, on the British side, of course, that um, Obama's going to uh, go and see the Queen, uh, which is something that apparently he's very excited about because, you know, one international rock star recognizes another one. I mean, she, she's, she's right up at, at that level of, of uh, I mean, you know, she's uh, getting on in years, but she's still a very glamorous uh, figure, and, and one got the impression he was rather more pleased to see her than he was to uh, see Gordon Brown again. <laughs> <That's a movie. laughs> yes. 
take of the movie The Queen. One, one quick brief one. He's obviously going to have time for uh, quite a number, maybe, of bilateral meetings, especially in London. Is there anything particularly at stake, or are those going to be mostly for show? Does it matter who he meets with, who he doesn't meet with, uh, with so many people in one place? The bat is going to be China. I mean, obviously, you've seen from the early stages, you know, the, the, the from the Secretary Geithner's nomination hearing about the currency speculation with the recent statements about the Chinese, about Treasury bonds and, and whether they'll continue to buy them. That is both, you know, from an economic standpoint, perhaps the most important bilateral relationship and one where there's the most issues to be flushed out over both the short and long term. So I think that that's obviously going to be critical. Um, in addition to the European leaders, and then also in some of the some of the others that are out there, like uh, you know South Korea, obviously he'll be meeting, and you've got the pending free trade agreement, and they may be chairing the G20 going forward. Um, so there, you know, there are a number. You know, I think you could go down the list of the different uh, bilateral meetings. Russia is obviously one where they've tried to you know press the reset button, and it may have gotten off to a bit of a rocky start. Um, so, uh, so so looking at those major powers and how those relationships starts, and the fact that this is going to be the first chance for those bilaterals. People will be very closely reading the tea leaves to see where those go, both in terms of the inter multilateral interactions and the key issues bilaterally after those meetings. Just like to say a quick word about Russia, which I think is really important. And, and um, uh, the Russian Medvedev uh, uh, will, will be taking a measure of Obama in the way that Khrushchev did of Kennedy. In, in Vienna, and it's really important in dealing with uh, Russian leaders or Russian governments that that you hit the right note of firmness. It, it's not um, enough just to say let's be friends and, and let's enjoy playing with this little yellow and red Lego piece with a, with a, with a button on it. That, that, that doesn't work with the Russians. I mean, the, 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 in fact, that's just the wrong way to go about it uh, because they think, ah, oh, here's someone I can lead up the garden path. You know? You, you, you've got to stake out clear, firm positions with them and not just say, uh, can't we all get along together? Yeah, I, I think just on that, I, I do think that the bilateral meetings, uh, this is a heavy multilateral agenda. In some ways, the only place, and going back to the question about Michelle Obama, too, that really the, the major bilateral visit is, is to Turkey, which is very interesting. So that, and that will be very interesting, too, in the way in which uh, both uh, the President and the First Lady interact with the people in, in Turkey. So that, that will be where they can be more visible in terms of uh, the, the impact. But um, I, I think that in some of the bilateral meetings on the margins of the G20, others that, and I don't know, the, you know what the full schedule of them are, but I'm sure they'll be very frenetic. But I'm sure with Russia, my sense is the Russians are quite pleased because they've gotten signals that the uh, U.S. administration does want to put the more traditional arms control process back on track. Uh, there are a number of people coming into the administration that have that background that are, uh, including some of our former colleagues here who are, are advising on how to proceed on that. So the whole question of, and the sense of urgency that the Russians have of, of getting the start uh, uh, follow-on treaty uh, uh, worked sometime this year, the, the Moscow Treaty, further efforts on uh, on other aspects of, of strategic stability and the discussions that were reached or the agreement that was reached on a longer, broader strategic dialogue. I think some of that could be done in a maybe not so visible and high profile way, but you could still make some progress. And, uh, you know, the fact that he will have a chance to, uh, to, uh, to see uh, Medvedev and, uh, to, uh, and to, to sort of uh, at least show that there's a direction coming. And, and I suspect there might even, who knows, there might even be an announcement of a U.S. Russian. Uh, summit meeting because I think that is that is sort of one of the interesting missing dimensions that's out there right now. Thank you, Thank you all very much, and I uh, hope, hope that was helpful. And uh, again, we're uh, happy our media folks are happy to provide any follow up, and uh, and we do have uh, some other things as I mentioned too. For those of you, are, are the we probably. Uh, it's been out for a while, but this report on NATO uh, may be helpful to you as background. And this is a short executive summary. We uh, it's on our website.